Welcome to week two of the high school huddle. I'm Thad Brown along with AJ Feldman. We're breaking down all kinds of section five stuff, football, soccer, and beyond some of our favorite players, teams, fun stuff. It's all high school all the time, uh, all in your podcast lap. And AJ, um, you know, I think uh, the big story from week two, obviously was the fact that I was able to avoid shooting an overtime football game, which is a first for this year. Um, I had two days in a row. I'm not doing it. I did have a couple that were close. Um, the, the Brighton, uh, you prep game came perilously close to forcing me to another overtime, but, uh, I'll take that big W this weekend. Yeah. When we were uh, texting about that game back and forth the whole time, we were figuring out ways to get overtime and it came pretty darn close throughout. Uh, somehow you avoided it. So did I, but I got some, uh, some girls soccer overtime this, uh, this weekend, two overtimes, no goals, one, one tie. So, you know, you win some, you lose some, but, uh, yeah, it was a good week of football frenzy, good week of high school football, and things seem to uh, really be picking up right now. That's true. I should not be complaining about football overtimes, or at least I'm guaranteed highlights and a winner every time I get there. So, uh, you know, definitely points for me for last week's triple overtime situation. Anyway, um, let's talk about uh, the, the big story statewide, actually, high school sports. Maybe not huge, but certainly a, a notable, you know, moment in the season. First time this year we've had state rankings out. Um, you know, for football and soccer and all the rest of the fall sports. We'll go through just the football and the soccer here. But, uh, AJ, give me some of the notable teams. Let's start uh, – well, actually, you, you got – you're kind of in charge of this, so you start wherever the heck you want to. All right, we'll start with football. Right now, uh, the New York State Sports Writers Association only put out uh, football and boys soccer right now. So that's what we've got. So that's what we'll be talking about. We start off with Class AA, McQuaid, third in the state right now. And the only two teams above them, Iona Prep and Canisius out of Buffalo – both private schools. So McQuaid right now is the number one dog in, uh, in public schools right now. Um, if you're a big state football fan, Oceanside in section eight is number five and Lancaster in section six, probably a little more um, notable given they'll play in that far West regional game if possible, but McQuaid top dog in, in the public schools in, uh, in class double A right now. And one, one point to make there, you know, someone listening at home thinking, well, you know, McQuaid is also a private school. But the, the situation is in Buffalo with Canisius, they don't let the private schools compete in the, the general state championship that everybody knows and follows. So they're not a factor when it comes to McQuaid winning a state title. And same for Iona Prep because, you know, Long Island and, and New York City are generally uh, just off the radar when it comes to state football championships. So, yeah, so McQuaid's number one. And, and AJ, I mean, we talked about it last week. We'll talk about it probably a little this week, too. They've played every bit like it so far. Yeah, in Section 5, you do have Aquinas in at number 13. That's the only other team in Section 5 getting state ranks. And we'll see as we move throughout this. There's a lot of carryover from last year. The teams that were good last year staying at the top of the rankings, obviously, uh, you know, it's very predictable. We're only two weeks in. You can't learn so much. So certainly McQuay gets a lot of, uh, you know, love for, you know, losing, um, you know, going to the sectional finals the past two years, winning sectional finals, going far in states two years ago. So they're getting a lot of uh, carryover from that, but certainly uh, a good side for McQuaid so far. Going down to Class A, another team, Canadigua, they're number three in the state right now in Section 5. Uh, two public school teams above them, so not quite the same way as McQuaid, but Canadigua, you know, we talked about it last week. They look good. They are good. And, um, you know, certainly statewide, it seems like they're going to be pretty good as well. Yeah, and we, we both like Canandaigua a lot. They won impressively over Eastridge uh, week one, got another big win. I mean, just a dominating win last week. It was 28 nothing in the first quarter, you know, so for Canandaigua. So early on, you know, at least it, I always kind of look at these rankings kind of with a bit of a jaundiced side and think, how can anybody possibly know how Canandaigua stacks up with some team in Binghamton versus some team in Buffalo versus some team in Albany? But um, from what we've seen, for Canandaigua to be a top three team in the state, very, very reasonable. Especially with, um, I'm sure it's probably less this year, you know, the pandemic, people are keeping their travels down, probably less intersect or intersection games yeah. teams playing from other ones and in class double A, you know, section five did have some, you know, teams playing Canisius and stuff like that that got wiped out when uh, when Edison dropped out. Um, so now everybody's just playing in section five. So even probably more than in years past, you're going to only see, you know, teams playing teams in their own section. So it's going to be kind of tough to gauge these things once we get to, you know, the state tournament. Moving on to um, some of the, the lower classes, Class B, Honeyway Falls Lima at number five, Batavia at number seven. Those teams were the top two in Section 5 last year. HFL might have had a good chance for a state run, and they've reloaded, and they're looking good so far as well, and, uh, you know, the sports writers seem to think so as well. Yeah, I've been impressed by HFL. Um, haven't seen a ton of them. 
Um, but, you know, a week one win over Livonia, a team that won a sectional championship last week, or last year, I should say, um, that's pretty much all you need to know. And HFL, you know, really dominated that game with Livonia. So, again, a, you know, a top five state team and here in Section 5, we're thinking, yep, yep, no, no surprise here. Yeah, I'm just kind of uh, mentioning uh, Class C, uh, as you said, Livonia, even with that loss, they're number seven. Class D, Avon, number three, 2-0 so far out of Section 5, and then Red Jacket, 2-0 uh, in eight men right now and before we get over to soccer i do want to mention we didn't really touch much on class a the other teams brighton and spencerport both ranked those teams are definitely going to be the the runners up to canada in that class so we'll see uh, how that shakes out I, I will say aj brighton being a stank state ranked football team i know it's early and and you know you don't accomplish much in a football season after two games but for brighton that is uh, quite a step for them that's this is a program that's been you know, okay to mediocre for the majority of the last couple of decades. And, and they're pretty good now. And we might talk about them a little more later on. Um, but they certainly have earned that state ranking. Congrats, congrats to the Bruins. Um, because I know it's a, probably a big deal for them. We definitely will be getting to them later on. A uh, little teaser for you there. And <laughs> switching over to boys soccer um, in Class A. We'll start with Class A, actually, because Sutherland right now is at number three um, in the state ranking, starting off 3-0. Um, you've also got ranked in Class A, Webster Thomas, uh, 11th overall with a 2-1-1 record. And Sutherland, they had a great season last year. That's always a, a strong program traditionally. Uh, and, and, you know, they're picking up right where they left off from last season as well. Yeah, and then actually they're 4-0 now. They, we just had their highlights on uh, Tuesday night. They knocked off Arcadia one zip on a John Field uh, second half penalty kick. And um, Arcadia, you know, usually a good team. They started out 1-0-1. So, you know, nothing to, to believe otherwise so far from the Titans. And uh, Pittsburgh, you know, looks like Pittsburgh. I know that game, you know, for the most part was played in the Arcadia end. Um, so, you know, Sutherland, even in a one nothing win, you know, looked pretty dominating on Tuesday. And then in class double A, probably, uh, you know, the top team, well, the top team in the state right now, apparently is right here in our backyard with Penfield um, out of section five. Uh, other teams ranked in the top 20. You've got uh, Hilton at number 14 and McQuaid at number 18, both. Um, strong teams as well. And I'm just going to bring up the, the Penfield schedule real quick, if I can get that for us. They have played some tight games. Um, I was at one of those games last Saturday. They took on Fairport, which is not ranked in this top 20, which I thought was a little surprising. Um, Penfield and Fairport, that was a very even game, a very close rivalry matchup. Um, you know, two strong soccer schools, had some great fans out there. Penfield got their first goal kind of off of a, uh, you know, a, a pretty generous uh Foul led to a free kick, led to a you know a, a good goal from Penfield. They scored their second one on a corner kick, where it was a little controversial whether or not it maybe hit the um, the football goal post. It went high, hit the post, somehow stayed in. Um, you know, it didn't have a great angle, but I thought it was a good goal. And then Fairport took them to the limit. They scored with about 20 minutes to go. Last five minutes, they had three really great uh, opportunities to score there. Did not get that goal. Props to the Penfield goalie Josh Robinson. He made about three good saves there. And Penfield for, you know, being the top team in the state right now, they beat Churchville Charlotte by one, two, one. They beat Fairport by one, two to one. They beat Penfield by one, two to one. So for being the top team in the state, certainly it either says, you know, maybe Penfield isn't quite at that level yet or just section five from, you know, that second tier is really good, which is probably more, uh, more along the lines of uh, what we're thinking here so far. AJ, you, you gave the schedule. What you said it was uh, Penfield. Give me the third. The third team you said was Penfield. And obviously, Penfield didn't beat Penfield. Who was the third team that played them tight? Uh, Rush, Rush Henrietta. Rush Henrietta. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just to give props out to the comments there for for pushing the number one team in the state. So, um, I, I would, you know, I mean, we're not here on this podcast to like rip apart high school athletes for sure. So you might think, wow, of course you're going to think Section Five is doing well. But this has been a pretty good soccer section for a while, and it would not surprise me to know there, or to see you know, other teams like Fairport and Rush, you know, being among the, the best in the state and certainly being able to hang with Penfield. Penfield, um, two decades ago, had the elite program, maybe in the state, certainly in Section 5. Um, it hasn't been quite to that level, you know, early in, in the 2010s, but, um, you know, clearly a, a program that's always been capable of getting to this level and, and no surprise here. And it's, you know, I've, I've kind of seen Penfield as the, uh, the high tide that lifts all boats kind of thing. And I think that's what you're seeing from the rest of Section 5. Yeah, and Shane McMillan last year, he was a junior. He was... Um, you know, you can make a case that he was the best player in Section 5 last year. And I was kind of surprised when he came back because I thought it was just at that high of a level where you kind of assumed he would be a senior. 
him and Gibson Spector both have five goals on the year, and we mentioned Josh Robinson. He really impressed me in that. Um, that's going to be a big game in boys soccer this weekend, Saturday. Um, Penfield versus Hilton right now, apparently the top two teams in Section 5. Um, you know, we talked that Penfield are winning close ones. Last three games for Hilton, 7-0 over Schrader, 3 to nothing over Victor, 4 to nothing over Ronicoy. So they're taking care of business. They also beat uh, Rush Generator 5-2 early in the year. So there's your direct comparison game. And Hilton, uh, you know, it's just one game, but Hilton had a good, uh, a better showing against Rush Generator. So that should be a good matchup this Saturday, 6.30 at Penfield. We'll have more uh, games to look ahead to this weekend later on in the huddle. Let's move on to our first uh, regular segment. It's uh, taking a story, um, one opinion, and, and a story if we have one from the last weekend. And uh, AJ, I'll go first. And, you know, normally these takes are about this is a player or a team I like. This is a trend I like in Section 5 because I hated it last year. I'm just happy to see Section 5 teams catching punts because if I hear the word poison, in another high school football game, I'm going to probably snap a camera over my leg. Last year, it seemed like, well, last year being a few months ago, no one had any idea how to catch a punt. And look, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't mean anything here nor there. But as someone who's interested in watching the game and seeing highlights, to see a punt, you know, bounding 20, 25 yards downfield because you simply can't get a kid to catch it, you know, that, that bothered me. And I know, like, high school coaches deal with a lot of stuff. It's not just about football. And, you know, catching a punt is not the most rudimentary football skill. But this year, kids are doing it. And we've seen some big plays off of them. Canada Day, well, just last weekend, had two punt returns for a touchdown. One got called back for a penalty, but at least one counted. And congrats to everybody in Section 5, at least the games I've seen. Y'all are catching punts this year, and I know that I, for one, am thankful to see it. You know, when you said that, I kind of thought in my head, I haven't really seen that so far. But then I'm thinking about how much I saw last year. I had a running joke in my head that I only found funny is that when they would yell out poison, I would yell out a different classic rock band. I do queen, you know, Def Lover, they're yelling out poison. I'm like, you know, you know, ACDC. That was uh, my running joke. Um, but this is an another side point. I think teams should go for fourth downs way more than they do right now. Um, just to kind of branch off of that. The punting, unless if you have a good punter, and high school punters are really tough to do because, you know, if you try and block a punt, you got to block everybody. You got to get the snap going good, which is never easy as well. Mm -hmm. And then you got to get off a good kick. I averaged that the net yards on a punt that is actually caught, sometimes, you know, things roll, it's about 17 yards. And last week, um, <laughs> we, I was on at the, uh, the Rush Henrietta Pittsburgh game. I was shooting it with uh, Dan Fates over at 13 when we were talking throughout the game and we got into this discussion about punts before. And I'm like the net average of these punts, 17 yards, 17 yards, next punt. I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to, you know, sh call out that person next punt, 17 yards on the dot, net <laughs> average. <laughs> so I'm just saying, go for it on fourth down. The odds that you get that fourth down. If you have a, a competent passing game, if it's fourth and seven and like midfield, just go for it. That's just all I'm saying. I think it'll really help your teams out. Well, I think part of that too is, you know, when it comes to football, you know, some of those trends take a while to filter down to the high school level. You know, I mean, in, in the, like, I played football in the mid nineties and even then, you know, the NFL was still maybe a 50, 50 running passing league. But when I played high school football, you know, a pass was almost a trick play. So, you know, the idea of, I think more NFL teams are going for and fourth down now, I think that'll filter down the high school, maybe in the next five or 10 years, something like that. Yeah, so um, we definitely, you know, Catch your punts, go for on fourth downs is what we're saying. We agree. I, yeah, I agree. What do you got for a take, AJ? Uh, for my take, um, I'm going to go back to Brighton, as we mentioned it. I think right now they're the team to beat in uh, in Class A1 right now. You know, they beat UPREP, as you mentioned. Uh, that was probably the team going into last week that you thought was the team to beat. Obviously, um, you know, they got the loss there. They had the injury to, uh, to Jordan Jackson. Uh, we wish him the best. Um, you know, we've, sure. seen, we've seen stuff on Twitter, him staying positive, his teammates, um, you know, giving them support, stuff like that. So yeah. from what That's we've seen. People who are listening know he, he was, he hurt his leg in the fourth quarter. Uh, ambulance had to take him away. Um, you don't have any details on the condition, but, uh, you know, when the ambulance comes out, that's usually something pretty serious. Yeah, not not a, a, a good injury from uh, the, from the naked eye, uh, to say the least. And, you know, we've seen good, you know, him in good spirits at the hospital, things like that. He'll be back better than ever, uh, you know, is what he's saying. So. Um, you like to see that, but getting back to Brighton, as you mentioned, these last four years, they've been basically right at 500, either at 500 last year, they pulled the game above 500. 
Um, but they're looking good right now. They've got Brennan Klasgens, the senior quarterback. He can run the ball. He can throw the ball. Um, had two passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns in week one over Churchville Chalai. Um, had a good rushing score last week um, in that win over you prep. So you like to see a senior quarterback. You like to see a quarterback who can throw it and pass it. And they've got a pretty good, uh, you know, a defense that uh, even last year they had a pretty strong defense as well. Um, and this week they've got Webster Thomas, who is also undefeated. That might be uh, a sectional final preview. And, uh, you know, certainly Brighton uh, right now is looking really good so far. All right, let's move on to the story, and, uh, you know, th this will just be for me this week. And just, you know, when you're covering high school football games, all kinds of different things you're worried about. You know, for us in television, we're often trying to go from game to game, but there are a lot of still photographers down there with us. It's like a little family. You know, we all try to help each other out. We get along. You know, AJ was just talking about how he and Dan were having a chat. It's a regular thing for us, and not just between TV stations. So uh, last Saturday afternoon when I was covering the uh, finney Frewsburg eight-man game, uh, I believe uh, the I don't know him that well, but I've seen him a few times. His name, first name was Dennis. I'm um, on the sideline with me in, in middle of the first quarter. He comes up to me and says, Hey, have you seen my phone? Now, look, I, we've all had that moment. And, you know, when, when you don't know where the phone is, the phone is like the lifeline for everybody right now. It's pretty much the disaster of the day. And, you know, most of the time it's, I left it in the car or it's at some restaurant. There basically, there's somebody you could call to most likely identify, you know, yay or nay where the phone is. And then if it's there, you know, someone we, generally in this world will take care of the phone and make sure it, gets, it ends up in a good spot. When you're at a high school football game and you kind of by yourself on a sideline and there's no one around and the phone is somewhere there, I really can't think of a more disastrous feeling. I mean, outside of like, I lost it in the ocean, this is probably number two. So when, when Dennis says to me, you know, I can't find my phone, you know, of course I want to help him out. I said, you want me to call it and whatever. And so I called his phone and write the voicemail. He said, oh, you know, don't worry about it. And he was surprisingly calm considering the situation. I know I would have been bent, you know, like this is the only thing that matters to me. I got to find this phone. So the Finney field, um, they only have stands on the, on the sidelines and behind one of the end zones, it's like downhill to like a weed area. And, and it's kind of thick. Apparently Dennis found his phone in the weeds. I don't know how he did it. You know, I mean, we've all tried to, you and I have played golf enough to know you still looking for something in the weeds. You got like what, a one in five shot of finding it, but he located the phone there. And then AJ, I want to ask you about this. He told me later that the reason he couldn't hear his phone, because we were close to the phone in the vicinity when I called it, is that he's got a setting on his phone that if someone calls that they don't, he doesn't know or probably not a contact, it goes right to voicemail. I wouldn't do, I mean, why would you, I understand why, I would not do that because the whole point of having the phone, a lot of us don't even have, you know, home phones or any other way to communicate with people, is that if, you know, if someone calls you, they want to talk to you about something. So, I mean, I guess you could check the voicemail, but I don't know that would and look I'm, I'm certainly someone that's as bothered by spam calls as anybody else but I don't think I would ever want that on my phone luckily the iPhone uh you know that isn't on team iPhone so he wouldn't know about this no, they're, they're, they're getting pretty good at uh detecting these spam calls and you will get um a notification where it says spam likely as the thing so that's doing a pretty good job where I wouldn't probably want to turn off all outside uh, calls for my contacts um um, but it's definitely a thing. I mean, my mom, she won't pick up anybody if it's not in her context. Um, so hopefully nothing happens to me when, uh, when somebody else has to make a call, but, uh, yeah, and I, I never have my phone on ringer to begin with. So hopefully you can hear that vibration, but, uh, yeah, definitely not a good situation you want to be in. Yeah. Well, I mean, for those of us who work in, in media, you know, the, the phone on vibrate is a pretty standard thing because, um, I would rather lose my phone than have my phone ring in the middle of a Sean McDermott press conference. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where you're at with, with keeping the phone on vibrate. All right, let's move on to uh, the team that we think deserves pub. This is, you know, a team most likely we, we watched recently. Um, that isn't being talked about a whole lot in section five, but we think should be AJ. Uh, you can go first with this one. I'm starting off with uh, Greece Athena starting off the year two and oh, they will certainly get a lot of pub if they win their next week because they have Canada at home. So That'll be a big test. We'll see real quick if they're for real or not. Um, but taking on uh, Olympia Odyssey last week, Jaden Rapp, senior quarterback, monster game last week, 11 for 13 through the air, 240 yards on just 11 uh, completions, four touchdowns, and a rushing touchdown. That's an impressive stat line. And he had an impressive play, uh, rolled out to his right, didn't like what he see scrambled back over left broke a tackle tossed one up to the end zone went for a play the most impressive play i saw in uh in my travels last week so you know greece athena um 
kind of like with Brighton traditionally, um, you know, the last four or five years, uh, they did go on a beat run. I believe it was in 2016 to the state championship game, if my notes are correct. Um, but until then, they've, you know, really fallen off and they're building themselves back up. And uh, they've really impressed me so far this year. My uh, team that deserves pub is uh, Danzo, Whalen, Cohockton. I know we're going to go down deep in the class rankings here, but this is another 2-0 team. I uh, handled their business, an impressive win week one against Newark. And then, uh, you know, I saw them uh, beat Wilson 24-20. to And they mainly make it into this because they ran the best hook and ladder I've ever seen. Um, not just because it was well executed. It really wasn't superbly executed. But it was the first time I've ever seen a hook and ladder where the, the pitch um, ended up bouncing off the ground right to the runner, almost like they planned it. I mean, if, if you can, if you can like be, figure out how to bounce a ball to a runner on the fly, then I would be coaching this every time in every football practice I've ever gone to. But obviously it's a hard thing to do. It worked in this case. Evan Pruto finished it off. And it turned out to be a big play too because they were tied with Wilson eight seconds ago in the half. They scored at the break and then uh, score first in the second half and, and win the game. So 2-0, uh, creative, successful, uh, Dan's away in Kohak and not getting talked about enough. All right, uh, our final segment here, or uh, second to last segment, final looking back segment, is our team of the week. This is quite simply the best team you saw. So not necessarily the best team in Section 5 or in a class, but in our travels, the, the best team you saw. AJ, you can go first again with this. I'm going with Spencer Ports. Um, you know, we highlighted that game, Spencer Port versus East last week, kind of a, a clash of styles, the Spencer Port, uh, you know, the wing tee, the you know, the grind them out versus East who likes to play a little more on the outside. I think Spencer Port, you know, they handled their business 34, 12 in that one. The only points East got in the first half was off of a, a kick return. Um, that game was, the, the score wasn't very close and that's kind of indicated by the way it played on the field. Spencer Port's going to be really good. Once again, um, I don't, you know, they don't play Brighton this year. So we don't, we're not going to see that game in uh, the regular season. They do get Canandaigua in week six. Um, I think Spencer Ports, they're just going to be able to impose their style on anybody they play except for Canadagua. So I think they do have a Athena matchup in week five. So that'll be a nice two game stretch to see how good Spencer Port is. But they've looked really good so far. Uh, Brenton Sheffield, 132 yards, three touchdowns on just seven carries last week. So he had a really nice game as well. So Spencer Port, the Rangers looking good once again this year. I love their fan section, by the way. So far, best fan section. They get really into it. They, uh, you know, they've got uh, the shirtless Rangers on their uh, on their chest. They got uh, some good cheers going. So Spencer Port, uh, my number one fan section so far this year as well. You did. Did you see McQuaid last week or did, we, did you miss that game? I did not go to McQuaid. Okay. All right. Well, then it, it, when we – well, I'll send you to McQuaid soon. Um, let's see. Do, you don't have McQuaid this week, right? No. So no. Uh, well, that, McQuaid is usually the acid test for football fan section. So we, we'll revisit this topic next time you see a McQuaid home game. Penfield also gets up there, too. I'll, I'll shout some love to the Patriots as well. Fair enough. All right. Uh, my team of the week is Aquinas. Um, it, it, you know, after week one where they and Victor kind of slogged it out and, and Aquinas won in overtime, you know, they, they knocked off Fairport pretty handily, 41-14, uh, maybe 42-14, whatever. The 40 points Aquinas scored, they scored them all in a row. They got down seven zip and then just ripped them off. Um, Will Benjamin, um, you know, I, I think everybody knew about his talent coming into this season. I think he's quickly developing into a guy that can be a force both as a runner and a receiver. Um, had a couple of nice plays uh, in the game I saw against Fairport. Um, Mikel White, the quarterback, um, you know, can run it a little bit, you know, throws it. You got to be able to throw generally to operate in that Aquinas offense. And he's been doing it enough early so far. Um, so, you know, that that win to me kind of said, okay, you know, that that's what I expect Aquinas to be. Um, you know, again, two weeks into it, they've got to deal with McQuay at some point this year. Um, so that'll be, you know, then we'll find out really what the Irish are about. But that was certainly – an impressive, I don't want to say get well because they were one to know, but um, you know, like I said, they, they look like Aquinas in that game. Kind of more of a, a feel better win. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. All right, AJ, let's look ahead to the weekend. What's I know we talked about it a little. What's big uh, coming up this weekend in section five? Yeah, we got a little bit into it before about Canada, Athena, both undefeated as well. Um, and in also in class uh, A1, uh, you've got Thomas and Brighton both undefeated. So those are two pretty good clashes. Uh, we've touched on a little bit, but if you want to expand on a little more about those games, uh, we should expect to be pretty good right right now. Yeah, the Thomas Brighton one's the one that's fun for me. You know, I like it when teams um, start out, you know, well in a spot where you're not expecting them to, or maybe where they haven't been successful out lately. Webster Thomas has been really down the last couple of years. Like I said, Brighton's been kind of hovering around 500. So, you know, the winner of this game is going to feel really, really good about themselves. 
um, going forward too. And they, they've both been impressive, but I think, you know, with both teams, we're kind of like, all right, you know, you're two and all great, but l- let's see you beat somebody quality. And, and, and this will certainly be that this week. Um, the Athena candidate game to me, and you really, you know, kind of nailed it. This is the, you know, Athena used to be superb, you know, can they get back to that level? Because, um, you know, we, we've seen nothing out of candidate that indicates they're going to be susceptible to anybody in section five. Athena might be, you know, one of the teams that could push them. Yeah, and that quarterback matchup in that Thomas Brighton game, you got Brendan Claskins, who we already touched on, Eli Adams, week one, two passing touchdowns in the first half, three rushing touchdowns in the second half, week two against Churchville Chilai, over 300 yards of total offense, um, 236 through the air, 77 on the ground. So those are both two dual threat quarterbacks. That should be a pretty good matchup there. Um, another one to watch for um, in the can anybody knock off McQuaid? prove it matchup is Pittsburgh Aquinas both undefeated uh both looking to maybe take that number two spot in class double a yeah Pittsburgh like Aquinas had kind of a, a feel better win as you want to put it they were coming off a, a win week one but a not very impressive win week one they went to overtime with Monroe great you know great game um so you know I think this is certainly the battle to be the number one contender you know uh, McQuaid has the belt until further notice but I think the win of this game will be the one that we universally look at as, okay, I can't wait till McQuaid plays them, you know, and, and we'll see what happens this weekend. I think Aquinas' offense is a little more explosive, um, but, you know, Pittsburgh has a great program. Uh, Keith Molnis, the head coach there, um, they are not going to, you know, hand things to Aquinas. The Irish going to have to earn it, so it will be a fascinating game. And then we already talked about McQuaid, but they have a sectional final rematch against Victor at Victor at 7 o'clock on Friday, where – from what we've seen so far, we think it might not be the uh, the heavyweight battle that we saw in the sectional final game. Last possession game came right down to the wire. But certainly Victor gets a chance to prove themselves um, to whether or not they really are at the level of the McQuaid's for this year. Yeah, and, and you know, Victor's the kind of team where if you expect them to be uh, a sleeping dragon, then you're probably going to get burned. Um, so, you know, it's certainly, you know, we, we're, we've we talked about this game. We're like, McQuaid's look really good, but it is Victor. So, you know, we, we're certainly interested to see how that one comes out. And, uh, yeah, those are definitely our top matchups for, for week three. And like we mentioned at boys soccer before, Penfield-Hilton, that'll be a great battle as well to, uh, you know, maybe uh, really change out the state rankings as well. All right, so keep an eye on uh, News 8 uh, tomorrow night, Friday night, and Saturday for highlights on Football Frenzy both days. It'll be myself and AJ on Friday. AJ has to operate solo because I have the uh, tough assignment of traveling to Miami for Bill's Dolphins over the weekend. So I'll be out of town on Saturday. But uh, you can count on News 8 to have a, a whole bunch of highlights. And again, here on rosterfirst.com. If you miss it live, um, it, it sits here on the friendly interweb as long as you want it to be. So uh, you'll be able to see it then. AJ, thanks for joining us. And uh, we will see you all next week on the High School Huddle.